Hey, this is Tony Boss Bowling coming to you from the Lincoln Attic Podcast. Hey, hey, it's Jason ODB, the Lincoln Attic, hitting you with another episode, Milestone Episode 25. Thanks for everyone that continues to come back here and listen via your favorite podcast app. Certainly appreciate that. So, Lincoln Addict episode 25. Man, this is a jam-packed episode. We got so much to talk about. A wonderful guest I'll talk about in a minute. I do want to stop and give a huge shout out to our key partners, including Devious Customs. Jeff and team at Devious Customs continue to produce some of the best parts we've ever seen for these Lincolns, whether you're looking to do a resto mod or potentially keep your car looking kind of factory-ish, right? He he makes a lot of different stuff. Uh, they produce a lot of stuff in-house. If you go to DeviousCustoms.com and um, you just take a look at some of their uh, different kits, you can go to Kits and Parts. And then uh, what I do, I tell people to, to go and shop Lincolns. And when you do that, it's going to pull up uh, all the different things, whether it's a a, a a fuel tank that you want, the suspension kits. He sells the Dakota Digital Gauges. Also, one of the newer products is the Lincoln Continental Gauge Bezel Set for the 1 through the 3, 61 through 63. They're made out of billet aluminum, so you can get rid of that pot metal. So much more, deviouscustoms.com. They're also, of course, on Facebook and Instagram. Next, Colorado Custom Wheels. I talk about Colorado Custom all the time. I'm running these wheels on my 64 Lincoln Continental. ColoradoCustom.com. You can go to one-offs and take a look at some of the stuff they've done. They also will, uh, if you want a one-off wheel, they'll make it. They also make the Lincoln replica wheels. They've made tons of these sets, and they're pros when it comes down to the backspacing that you need, depending on if you're running bigger brakes, factory brakes. Uh, you know, was it a, you know, what year car was it? That type of thing. Michael and team have dealt with this a lot. They'll take care of you that way. When you get your custom wheels in, they'll fit. You won't have an issue. And one thing that I love about the Colorado Custom Wheels is you have a little bit of a lip to them. I've seen this trend with people going with wheels and, you know, everybody has a preference, but, you know, kind of being for the mini truck world, I love a wheel that has a little bit of a lip. When um, some of these wheels that people are running nowadays kind of have that front uh, flat face, more of like what I think of as like a front wheel drive type car wheel. But uh, again, Colorado Custom, check it out. Uh, on Instagram, Facebook, or ColoradoCustom.com. So with all of that out of the way, again, jumping into episode 25, want to give you guys kind of just this highlight uh, overview. And it's my honor to say that we're going to have Adam Janai from Mob Steel slash Detroit Steel Wheel Co. on this episode. When I started thinking about doing Lincoln Attic Podcast many years ago, I knew in my head certain guests that I wanted to have on. We've had some of those folks on, so kind of check mark there. Uh, Adam was really at the, kind of the top of that list as well, which I certainly appreciate. And this is one of my favorite interviews uh, right up there kind of with John Cashman. And I uh, really appreciate, uh, whether you're into Lincolns or not, this um, episode is fantastic because Adam is, is a really positive guy, very forward-thinking and I can't wait to bring the audio to you guys here just in a little while. Before we get to that, I would tell you to go and check out Mob Steel on Instagram or Facebook, Detroit Steel Wheel Co. Also, Emma, Mob Steel Emma. I think Pam is on there, which is Adam's wife. Of course, Steve-O is a great guy. Uh, and then uh, Adam has his own Instagram as well. But, you know, they all fall under the Mob Steel. But, of course, uh, they have their individual ones as well. So, Go out there, very hardworking, blue-collar type folks that are trying to make a difference, especially in their city. He'll talk about that. And uh, shout-out to Mob Steel, but shout-out to Emma. I've got a chance to meet Emma a couple times at one of my favorite truck shows in the world, Lone Star Throwdown, every February in Conroe, Texas. There's usually a couple Lincolns out there as well. She comes out, and uh, same thing she does at SEMA or any other uh, event. She'll line up and track down who's running those Detroit Steel Wheel uh, wheels, and uh, though she just does a fantastic job with taking photos, and then they take that for their social media, uh, some of their branding, their website, you name it. Uh, Emma is 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 not the man; she's the woe man. Okay, so Mob Steel Emma, just look her up on Instagram. Many of you are probably following her. She does a great job, and uh, shout out to her. Thank you for lining up Adam to come on this episode. 
But uh, the episode overview is brought to you by Steel Rubber. I've often talked about uh, great products out there. There's really none greater when it comes to certain parts you need for your cars than Steel Rubber, S-T-E-E-L-E, rubber.com. You'll land on their website, and then you can select the year, make, model, and style. So, you know, sedan, convertible, coupe, you name it, depending on your vehicle. And, uh, of course, they make stuff for boats and all that stuff as well, RVs. But for these Lincolns, I've talked about it a lot. We've had steel rubber on before. One of the most important things you can do is replace those old, worn-out weather strips. They make a ton of them. They make almost every piece, depending on the make and model and year, from kind of like 61 to 69. There's still a few small things out there, but for the most part, I've talked about it with my 64. When I ordered the parts, man, I ordered pretty much everything they had, and they um, delivered it. I did a video a long time ago. I think it's out on our YouTube channel. Uh, you can search like Lincoln Attic Steel Rubber, and you'll see that. So shout out to Steel Rubber. Now, the previous episode recap kind of just a short o- overview here of the previous episode, just to kind of give folks insight. If you're new, I'm sure we're going to pick up hopefully some listeners with this episode having Adam on from Mob Steel and Detroit Steel Wheel. Uh, please, if you get a chance to, however you're listening, click that follow or subscribe, right? So it depends what app you're using. It'll say one of those two words. It's free. That's the main thing you got to know. And when you subscribe and or follow, that will uh, you know, basically notify you. So if you're on an iPhone, like many of us are, and you're using that pre-installed podcast app, that purple icon, uh, you'll basically get a notification you know, that, hey, a new episode has dropped. Uh, if you're on Android, you know, Podbean is a fantastic app. And then some of you are listening on YouTube. I think around episode 22, 23, I fixed whatever glitch there was, and these episodes will batch over to YouTube. And you can listen there, of course, as well. If you're on YouTube, please subscribe. The best experience really is listening through a podcast app. So I have spent some time and I've went out there and I've submitted the podcast to different outlets. So if there's an outlet that maybe, hey, you usually listen to podcast on and you don't see it, shoot me an email, lincolnaddictpodcast at gmail.com and uh, I'll do my best to, uh, to get that submitted. So I appreciate everyone. But the last episode recap, uh, that's what I meant to go over here. It was episode 24, uh, kind of a shorter episode, but I kind of went over what I call things going on in the LC. And I'm not talking about Lincoln Continental, I'm talking about the Lincoln community. So, you know, it's it's great to bring these episodes. And what I've had to kind of tell myself is that, you know, people are, you know, just like me, I just want that content. So there's a lot always going on in the Lincoln community whether it's events or it's new products that we've continued to see come out from different companies. And I'll continue a pretty good, you know, I I think a good round number is going to be about bi-weekly. I think technically last week would have been bi-weekly for the new schedule. But I am going to, you know, I'm not going to talk about trying to do it. I'm I'm just going to make it happen. And uh, every two, three weeks, you'll see a new episode drop, you know, some with a guest, some with just key updates. And uh, thanks to everyone that has like given a thumbs up or a comment. I've had people message me or leave a comment on YouTube to say, hey, you helped me out. Appreciate your time. You know, lately I've been doing some different stuff on YouTube through Lincoln Addict. And uh, I do it to help people. You know, I do it also because I enjoy doing it. But, um, you know, it means a lot when somebody goes, hey, man, appreciate it. You know, you saved me some money. Uh, you steered me the right way. Or, hey, you know, I just enjoy the content. So, again, with the last episode, go back and listen to it. If you're new, uh, you can check it out again. Just, you know, if you're in the pre-installed podcast app, go back to that previous episode. Now, eventually we'll have enough of these where the only way to be able to go back, I don't know what podcast apps go back to now, 24, 50 episodes. I don't know, but Podbean, which is an app on Android or iPhone, or you can go to, uh, Lincoln Addict on the website. You can, um, listen there through that app and, uh, it's pretty simple. But since they host the podcast, you'll always be able to go back to the beginning. So the previous episode recap brought to you by our family at Griot's Garage. I had Nick on. I was so honored to have Nick Griot on. And uh, if you're not following them, you're missing out. He had hinted at their new he had hinted at their new products that were coming. And I just watched last night on their YouTube channel 
the uh, the update for their ceramic type products. And I tell you what, I'm pretty impressed. I have a lot of their stuff, but I don't have the new stuff. So I'll be talking about that in the, in the near future. And I'll be also doing some videos on our YouTube channel. Uh, I'll be detailing the red car that I own. And I'm looking forward to that. So Griot's Garage, G-R-I-O-T-S, garage.com. They're, of course, pretty much on all social media channels, including YouTube. Now, speaking of past guests in Grio's Garage, I did um, want to give a huge shout out to Nick again for coming on, and I can't thank him enough. He's a great dude. I posted his uh, feature uh, recently, and um, he had the 63 Lincoln Continental that we talked about, kind of the hot rod Lincoln, but really well done, and that, I don't think we talked about it when he was on, but... Chris, a guy by the name of Chris Shelton shot it and it ran in Street Rodder Mag September of 2019. If you ever want to try to kind of get your hands on that older issue, the the main title of it is Home is Where the Hot Rod Is and uh, just some amazing rolling shots of the car. So I did recently um, come across some of those photos in my album uh, in terms of my phone and I wanted to, sh- I wanted to, uh, to share that. So uh, huge shout out to Nick. Love what he's doing over there, kind of on the social media front. Uh, Grio's Garage again. Huge shout out. All right, so just some general Lincoln Life updates. The really the only thing that I that I think I have to share is maybe there's a couple. So uh, I did a pre-sale on the shirts recently, and we we had a good amount of numbers uh, for the pre-sale. So thanks to those that you know placed an order on LincolnAttic.com, the new website. If you haven't and you want to get a shirt. I submitted and paid for that pre-sale through who we go through graphic disorder. Okay. You can go to lincolnaddict.com and you can uh, order a shirt. Now what I do is I order a few extra in different sizes that sell the most. And I put those out there for you to purchase. Now, if that order comes in, let's say, you know, you're hearing this on Friday and you go, man, I want to place an order. Please note, it's going to be a couple weeks before those ship. Once they ship, I will send an email I'll blast it out to everyone that has placed an order and I'll say, hey, good news, they're on their way to us. Once I get them, I will uh, get those turned around pretty quickly. Uh, I like to get the pre-sales out as quick as I can. And uh, once I ship them, then I update the tracking number through the website and then biggity boom, you then have your tracking number and then you'll get your shirt a couple days later. So leakinaddict.com. There's one shirt in one color. It's the black shirt. And uh, it's just to kind of get the brand going. Believe it or not, I've been sitting on this artwork for over a year, thanks to my friend Tony at Asphalt Army. A great guy. He's got his whole brand popping off with all kinds of cool merch on his website. And uh, he, I commissioned him to do some artwork for me. And we had launched the stickers, right? And I just, I kept telling myself, man, I need to get this off the ground because I've got all these other things in the works and these other ideas and things like that. And before you know it, I'll wait too long and I'll procrastinate and, you know, someone else will come out with it. So got to get it going. Again, LincolnAddict.com. If you want to uh, make a purchase, there's two stickers available. If I have the stickers in stock, I'll ship them quick. Of course, if you order a shirt, the sticker will ship with the shirt. And um, I did have to re-up the stickers, so the white sticker and the blue sticker, I'll have more of those coming. Again, you can order them on the website. The other update is I'm recording this portion on Thursday. Richard Lund from Suicide Slabs fame, Richard, as we call him Lund, I call him Lund, he is in town in Clearwater. I know today he went and kind of did some gallivanting around the state. And uh, we're going to go see him probably Friday night, get some drinks, get a little bit of dinner, and it's pretty cool. I I haven't seen Richard in a while. Um, I was out in Dallas many years ago. I was just looking at those photos, and on a future episode of the podcast, maybe I'll get Richard on, and we got to talk about what happened when I went to Dallas. You won't believe it. Um, I was one night away. This isn't the part, but I do want to share this. I was one night away from meeting Andre 3000 from Outcast. If you guys listen to our Lifestyle Podcast or you've listened here, you know I'm a big hip-hop fan. And I had sat down at this place getting a drink, and this uh, the bartender goes, man, you know who was sitting in that same chair last night? I was like, I don't know who. 
Andre 3000 from Outcast. I was like, no way. And she goes, yeah, let me show you the photos. And she had like 20 selfies with them. And uh, sure enough, she goes, he was here in here last night, just chilling. Super nice guy. But that's, you know, a little bit of what happened that night. Craziness ensued. And um, again, maybe on a future episode of Lincoln Attic Podcast, I could talk about that and I'll share that with everyone and maybe get Richard on. I did uh, with texting him. This week, I did say, "Hey, man, dude, we got to get you on. You know, you're you're part of you know the original crew that started it. You know, him and Psycho is kind of the way I always think about it. But I want to get the true story from him, and then talk about uh, not only does he have the awesome '61 uh, Sleeping Beauty, but then he's got you know the other car that he picked up. He's got a couple. Dude's got a lot of cool stuff going on. So good family, dude." Don't give him enough credit for, you know, what those guys do with Suicide Slabs and, of course, their Instagram and Facebook, and I think they're on TikTok. They got all that cool stuff going on, but rest assured, man, I'm down with Richard. He's a cool dude. I've got a chance to hang out with him before uh, when I was in Dallas. Got a chance to ride literally sitting on a Lincoln uh, kind of up on the the flapper through Dealey Plaza, and, man, it just was surreal had a lot going through my head uh, when I went there. It was finally my opportunity to go see Dealey Plaza. If you guys know me, I'm a big kind of JFK buff. I love reading books. I'm reading this crazy book right now. You know, I, I just as a kid, my birthday was on 1123. He was, of course, uh, assassinated on 1122. Now, we're pretty far apart in the years, but growing up, I would always see um, the different documentaries and stories and all the stuff that would air on the news about the conspiracy and all that stuff. So I kind of always have been intrigued by it. So when I went out there years ago, again, I got a chance during the day after my work shift to go and, and do the Dealey Plaza and the the sixth floor museum, as it's dubbed. More on that, too, by the way, because I, I kind of made this cool connection about a car that ties into that fateful day. Uh, and it's not the car that the president was riding in, but I'll be posting about that in the near future. But after that, um, I was there kind of several days, and I got a chance to link up with Richard and some of his homies that night. And that's when we did the cruise through Dealey Plaza, so it was good times. But I want to say those are the only Lincoln Life updates that I have for this episode. I mean, kind of short there, um, and we'll just move on to Lincoln sales. So I've said before... Uh, this kind of segment is is either maybe a car that I'm helping someone sell or some trends that I'm seeing in kind of the industry. And um, that's what I cover in this segment. And all I can tell you is the same thing I said in the last one. Sales are on the rise. And not only in the Lincoln community, but we've seen it kind of in the classic car market, whether it's trucks or cars. You know, you turn on Mecham or Barrett Jackson, you see just, you know, prices through the roof. That's a good thing for a lot of people. If you go out and you subscribe on our YouTube channel, you'll see that I had gotten this idea from different people and I kind of pieced together how I wanted to do what I'm doing. And I basically go out and I'll do a review of a listing. Most of the time, they're current listings on eBay, bring a trailer, you name it, these different outlets. Sometimes they're uh, a recent, recently ended classified. And, you know, it gives us an opportunity to talk through why did a car maybe sell for a little bit more money? What drove the sale higher? Let's look at the presentation of the car. Let's look at the photos. Uh, I will talk through some of the things I immediately look at, uh, where to look for potential rust and things like that. And like I've told people, I mean, I'm not the utmost expert. I've been around a lot of people that have, if you combined all the years of like a John Cashman, Blair Farmer, TC, Chris Dunn, some of the people that, you know, work at Lincoln Land, and you combine all of those years, I mean, there's, that's a high number of people that have been around, you know, you know, 200, 300 plus years of people that have been around, again, if you tally them all together. And, you know, that's a lot of knowledge, right? So I try to take all that and kind of go, hey, if you're looking to buy one of these cars, this is what you want to look for. This is what you want to avoid. And by doing those reviews, that's my way to kind of give back a little bit to all the people that have helped me. So again, I've seen a lot of cool comments and I'm going to continue to do more tech videos uh, as I find time. And uh, of course, I've got plenty to do. So 
I'll, I'll, I'll keep at it. But again, for this segment, I want to reinforce, go out to YouTube, search Lincoln Addict, hit subscribe or follow, and boom. Now, someone did recently comment, and I'd have to find it. I, I didn't save it uh, for this episode, but uh, I do want to talk about in the future how Bring a Trailer works. And what I mean by that is uh, it's gaining a lot of steam, and I'm sure like even eBay is kind of scratching their head because you know, for a long time, eBay was like the place, okay? But what I've noticed is Bring a Trailer is kind of on the rise, right, as we always say. But there is a process, and I think it's the buyer maybe has a fee. But uh, there was a gentleman that had chimed in on one of my posts. And let me just see if I can find it real quick. Uh, Lewis Leal says, Lincoln Addict, I think to sell his car, it was a listing fee. $125, he thinks. The buyer, on the other hand, pays the 5% fee, which is really where Bring a Trailer makes their money. And he said, he kind of went on to say, much better than those other auctions where the fees are charged to both buyer and seller. So, you know, a very interesting point. And I want to maybe dive more into that in the future. Like, you know, talk to someone that maybe has sold the car. Like, what did it, was it just 125 on their end? Like, what he's kind of saying? And then, biggity boom, someone buys, you know, a car for 30 grand and then, you know, boom, they tack on a fee. So, to me, that's kind of cool how they do it if that's if that's the way it works and that's the way it breaks down. But we'll talk more about that in the future. Now, uh, if you go on Instagram and follow Boss Bolin, B-O-S-S-B-O-L-I-N, that's my my brother from another mother, Tony Boss Bolin. He also has the Instagram Death Row Lincolns, kind of a, a story behind that that we'll share in the future. But if you follow Boss Bolin, he had just shared a 65 Lincoln Continental that's for sale for 25 grand. Okay, it's a convertible, it runs, it drives, it stops. Now, it's not a perfect car, it's far from perfect. When you look at the photos, you go, man, it looks pretty good. You know, Tony's had eyes on it. Uh, it is a car, I think, that could be saved from my understanding. I haven't seen it, um, so I don't want to give it the thumbs up or thumbs down. But if you are in the market for a convertible and you want more information, hit up Boss Bolin, B-O-S-S, Bolin, B-O-L-I-N, on Instagram, he's pretty good about direct messages, so you can send him a DM And uh, if you want more information. Um, I think he's just helping someone kind of kick it down the road in terms of a sale. Uh, he's not you know, looking to make commission on it or anything like that, so he could give you the real deal on it. But that's all I have uh, this week for the Lincoln Sales segment. I do want to thank AccuAir. Uh, we partner with them very uh, closely over at Our Lifestyle Podcast, also known as OLP. So I certainly appreciate them. If you're looking for air management for uh, your vehicle for, from an air suspension perspective, visit AccuAir.com. You'll see that they have a, a all-new redesigned website. They even sell um, merchandise now, including shirts and all kinds of stuff, air fresheners, you name it. But AccuAir.com, I love AccuAir. I've had it on several vehicles. I'll be running it on my 64 Lincoln Continental, and I can't thank AccuAir enough, so big ups to the team at AccuAir. All right, next we have Lincolns in movies, TV shows, and or music videos. This one's quick. There's an article on MeTV, if you want to check it out. Perry Mason is filled with some of the most beautiful cars ever made. And this gave me a little bit of insight. I have not ever went back and watched a lot of these episodes. I've seen a few. There is on this list of MeTV, uh, 19, 1965 Lincoln Continental Convertible, the case of the twice told twist. And it says in later years, notably the final season, Perry has traded in a fresh Lincoln Continental, traded in for a fresh Lincoln Continental. Thanks to this one outlier episode in full color, we get to see the baby blue shade. Unfortunately, the, the car gets pretty stripped here. If you have Amazon, you can go back and watch, as of right now, the episode. If you just want to see that segment, I did kind of a, a quick edit, and I put it on our YouTube channel and social media. If you go back and watch the episode, though, there's a lot of product placement with the Ford Econoline, Econoline van, of course, the 65 Lincoln Continental, the Mustangs, and so on. So it's a pretty cool episode. And as I mentioned right there, it was only um, the only episode, my understanding, that was in color. So it's pretty cool. 
it's a little disheartening what they do to the car, but someone did point out that when he pulls in, the interior's one color, and if you look closely, they do kind of a good job of kind of concealing, but it does look like it was a plant car so that, you know, hopefully they didn't take away a part of a brand new car. Now, some of the things they did, I mean, it wasn't super bad. When they started taking the convertible stuff apart, I'm like, eh. But uh, check it out. Again, you can go on our YouTube channel. You'll see those clips, or you can go on Amazon Prime and look up. I think it's the last season, the case of the twice told twist. And again, if you're in the older Ford stuff, including Lincoln's, uh, you'll appreciate kind of some of the uh, the time capsule of how it was filmed and, and, and some of the stuff that you'll see in there. All right, uh, last couple things. Smugglers Blues and my other car, Rita Hayworth, right? So those are the names of them. Those, uh, really no updates to share. So um, haven't had a time to really even cruise the cars much, other things going on, but... Of course, summer's here, and I'm going to be working on some of the air-conditioned stuff and a, a few other things. So rest assured, more to come on both of my project cars. And when I say project cars, they're, they're nice cars. They're just everything to me is a project. Lastly, before we roll into Adam's audio, I want to give a huge shout-out to all the people who have watched our YouTube channel or helped increase our subscriber base. We're well over 500 now on YouTube. i got to get to 1,000. Obviously, it'll start growing from there. And we also have to get our minutes watched up to 4,000. So uh, please, if you can, if you ever watch or come across, you know, something on our YouTube channel, watch it all the way through if you can. If you're at work and you're listening to the podcast, you know, let it run through the whole way, you know, so on and so forth. It really, really helps me out. So thank you. And uh, shout out to everyone that's come back here to continue listening to Lincoln Attic Podcast. Uh, I've had some good words of wisdom from people and people that have said, hey, man, keep doing what you're doing, and it means a lot. So thanks to everyone that continues to support. I want to thank Devious Customs uh, for all the support, Jeff and team. I'm going to be running their full suspension kit once Jimmy hopefully bags my car. Fingers crossed soon. Uh, Colorado Custom, I'm running those wheels on my car. I love those wheels. Michael and team, as I said earlier, great people. Steel Rubber, S-T-E-E-L-E, rubber.com. Hit them up. And then also, by the way, Griot's Garage, Nick and team. Fantastic folks. If you want to learn more about Steel or Griot's Garage, go back and listen to previous episodes here. Devious Customs, Jeff has been on as well. You can go back towards the beginning. And then Michael, I need to have him on. He was on um, back in the number 30s with our Lifestyle Podcast. I think it was like 33 or 35. So that was many, many, many years ago. But shout out to all of our partners. Everyone have a safe weekend. Enjoy this audio from Adam Janai from Mob Steel. Shout out to Emma and the entire team at Mob Steel and Detroit Steel Wheel Co. Great people. Stay on the rise. We out of here. Peace. Hey, hey, as I mentioned, man, so excited on this episode, Lincoln Attic Podcast, to bring Adam Janai on. How you doing, Adam? Hey, what's happening? How you doing? Man, everything's good, man. Thank you so much for taking some time. Uh, man, you know, when I started this Lincoln podcast several years ago, I kind of had an idea of some folks I wanted to have on, and you were at the top of the list, so I certainly appreciate you taking the time. Oh, man, I uh, I dig it. I mean, uh, anything uh, anything Lincoln, anything cars you want to talk about, of course, I'm game. <laughs> That's awesome, man. Um, did you I, – I, I did watch over the course of time the couple of shows that you guys have had, and I followed your – your business very closely for many years. Um, why don't you share a little bit of information, like maybe where you grew up and stuff? Because I kind of have a feeling, but I don't know if everyone that listens to the podcast knows. Yeah, I um, I grew up in um, uh, a suburb of you know, or, or the outskirts of Detroit, um, quiet place, up Brighton, Michigan. Um, but it was you know just like every other community that serviced the metro city. You know, it was all revolved around automotive. I grew up just on the just on the west side of the proving grounds, GM proving grounds, and you know, so it was just a part of our life. We used to ride snowmobiles around it as kids, and um, you know, I had relatives that worked there, and 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 and, and all over the place too. You know, our family came from downriver, and my grandfather worked downtown and was in the steel mill business for a while, and then started his own company. And the other half of my family was in the dealership business, um, so. You know, it was just it was just uh, cars all over the place, and um, you know a lot of a lot of really really positive influence, a lot of business influence. Um, and I came from a, a family and a community of you know some some 
some pretty hardcore people, you know, uh, really good people, good work ethic, um, you know, some successful people. So I had some really good influence. Um, but I think I started to kind of understand, like, a lot of us, you know, a lot of us kind of were raised the same out here. You know, it was a, you know, the, the American workforce type influence was a big deal for us growing up and, you know, kind of become what we, we valued, you know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's like, a, I think, a blue collar, I think, a hard working folks, many Americans that, you know, if you think about the impact they had on, on all the vehicles that, that came through that area that got shipped out to the rest of the, the country and the world, it's it's pretty amazing. Did you kind of feel like, um, you know, me being a Lincoln fan and kind of looking back at the history of a lot of the dealerships and how they used to look and things like that, it's so neat to me, the history of a lot of that. Did you find yourself getting a chance to kind of hang out at the dealerships and stuff like that? And you probably have some some fond memories of those early days. I mean, you know, as a family, I come from, you know, two pretty big families. The one, the side of the family that was the dealership side. You know, we used to have Christmas in the in the showroom, uh-huh. you know, so Christmas morning, you know, there would be this giant table and the Christmas tree. And, you know, we were amongst, you know, it, there could have been a Model T in the corner or, you know, the new Model SPO sitting there or something. Um, just, you know, really exciting stuff, uh, as a kid, you know, when you're into cars, you know, but we just were, it was just embedded in us, but yeah, it, it was, it was exciting, you know, dealerships and, um, the industry, you know, obviously has continued to involve, uh, evolve, but you know, the, the dealerships are just such a neat part of it. You know, it's really the, the glamorous, you know, side where you get to see the finished product and you get to celebrate it. And, you know, they used to introduce it to people there and it was, you know, kind of the first time outside of the international auto show as a kid that you got to put your hands on it you know it, you know so dealerships were awesome i mean they were like for me it was like it's probably the greatest place you could go without buying a ticket to get in you know what i mean right right yeah and having collected <laughs> i try to collect stuff for 64 65 lincoln's and you know some of the the collateral and stuff like that it, you know some's a little easier to get some's a little harder but it's neat to like to your point. Like I look at some of the old postcards and stuff where they had the dealerships on them, and you think back to the Lincoln Mercury days, and I mean the showrooms and the little dealerships were almost like, I mean people wanted to go there, you know. So it is cool that rich history, if you will, of um, you know that um, I guess I call kind of like Americana. Uh, there was that TV show yeah. called that for a while, but I think of that you know th- that impact uh, to so many lives, like the the people that sold the cars and the people that serviced them and all. Uh, a lot of cool history there. You know, we, we just uh, spent some time at the Gilmore uh, here in Michigan. Um, and they're, I'm trying to remember the exact town they're in, but they just got this crazy spread out there. It's just near Kalamazoo. And they've got a whole uh, a thing they call Dealership Row. And, wow. and they have reproduced full-scale dealerships. And you go inside of like a Cadillac dealership or, you know, um, a Mercury dealership, and, and you get a walk through generations of those vehicles and they're all very significant vehicles but just the the way that it was reproduced and the look and the feel it's really neat um yeah. so we had just recently done that that was that was super cool it was like stepping back into time wow. um uh if you ever get out there i'd highly recommend that it's it's probably one of the neatest experiences you know getting to step inside what you know um celebrating some of that, that dealership type moments is pretty cool yeah, I've got to check that on my or add it to my list. And I know my friend Tony has said how even I haven't made it to the Ford stuff. I know that they built so much around the Ford Museum and all that. And he said, "Dude, he goes, yeah, you can't go yeah. there in just one day, man." <laughs> no, it's all over the place. I mean, I, I love when people stop by the showroom and they're they're like, "Hey, you know what's what should I visit around here?" We're like, "Well, how long are you here?" And they're, "Well, we're flying out tomorrow." You're like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, there's it's so much. You, you know, between between all of the um, places they celebrate the history of the automotive industry, from Greenfield Village and the museums, and uh, you know the Detroit Historical Society has quite a collection, and we've worked with them. You know, we even got a chance to restore one of their uh, one of their one of a kind you know vehicles. There's only and it was you know really cool stuff. It's all over the city, and then you know spread out throughout it. Some of the greatest car collections. I mean, just incredible car collections around here. Um, that, that people let the public come in and look at them and have certain events that wrap around them. So it's all over the place, man. I, I recommend anybody who's remotely interested in, you know, anything from, you know, automotive manufacturing to, you know, just the history and into cars. It's, 
it's a great place to come visit for sure. Yeah, definitely. I'm, I'm adding it to the list, man. Um, before we talk about mob steel, which I do want to hit on, of course, you know, mm-hmm. I, I always think of like, you know, Lincoln, I've always loved Lincoln since I was pretty young and I think of Lincoln's tied to mob steel, but you probably have to have some fond memories. Like as we've kind of talked about and established of, of seeing different cars and things or were there, when you were in your younger years, like, did you see a certain vehicle or a certain type of car that you were like, man, you know, I want that. Um, I, I know everybody kind of has different, maybe fond memories, but I wasn't sure if maybe Lincoln's were something that, that you had stuck in your mind, even at an early age. Yeah. I mean, Lincoln's go way back. I mean, I played in, I played in one in my grandfather's barn as a kid. It was a 65. It was my uncle's wow. in, in, um, and it was just, you know, it was one of those things I would just, I absolutely loved the car. I was fascinated by the suicide doors, the the stance of it. And it was just, I loved the car. And, you know, dead Broncos and, you know, and obviously there was, a, there were so many different cars I would want, honestly. Mm-hmm. By the time, by the time I was picking out cars and, you know, by the time I actually bought a car and could drive, I, I probably, I probably picked out hundreds of vehicles and, and, <laughs> got down to custom customizing them and you know what i would do to them and you know before i even knew that i was going to be into customizing cars you know what i mean like yep i remember taking actual pictures of lincoln's and i would take an exacto blade and i'd cut around the fender wells and everything and then i would lower the body over the wheels and i would scotch tape it all back up and i would put it on the refrigerator <laughs> the old school photo show. so it, <laughs> yeah so i was like we were already bagging them out. I don't know how I was going to get it that low, but I just knew it looked cool because yeah, I, yeah. I like some of the low rider stuff. You know, I was influenced by some of the West Coast stuff that was going on. And, yep. you know, and I love the Lincoln. So I was applying all these visual things that, you know, I thought was cool. And, um, you know, I, so I was doing it before I even knew I was going to do it, I think. Yeah. But the Lincoln's been around for a long time. It's always been one of my favorites. But again, I, I, there's so many things I can pick out about vehicles. And there's, and there used to be things that, you know, I picked out about vehicles I didn't like and then found out that they really grew on me. You know, some of these design changes become, you know, something that I really love. And, you know, it's so it's also broadened my horizon, too. You know, so it keeps getting worse, I think, as I get older. <laughs> I, my bucket list is just ridiculous. Yeah, I know. Uh, I know what you mean. One thing that I, I know we're, you know, similar in age, you know, I grew up in the era of, like, you know, turning on MTV and seeing, like, you know, Ice Cube, it was a good day. And, of course... Uh, the Chronic, one of my favorite oh, yeah. albums, you know, and you see the Lowriders, and absolutely, you know, this year is yep. going to be the 30th anniversary in December of the Chronic, which is crazy. And I think to myself, yeah, <laughs> you know, how much that influenced a lot of us and Easy E going, you know, six foe. But then you think about like how Dr. Dre and Snoop did the Super Bowl this year, and if you go and if you spend any yeah. time on Instagram, I mean, the amount of Lowrider theme pages and songs and cars, like it, it's amazing that that piece of our culture in terms of you know vehicles and stuff is just amazing i love that it's still around man yeah i i mean i grew up i mean from the start of it i've just my playlist is full of it there's no <laughs> yeah. there's no deny there's no denying it there's yeah. no denying it and yeah. um so you know i was influenced by the same thing a lot i remember when my mom got got in one of my cars and I had the the chronic. I just I just got and it was a I just got it. Yeah. And my mom pops it out of the player and literally just chucks it out the window. We we're driving. She'll attest to the story. I was yeah. like, What? I just bought that. She's like, That is the most crude thing I've ever heard. <laughs> yeah. Like, the same with I, I had my to... mom would be down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I thought you'd oh, be down with listening to that. I had no idea, but whatever, you know. Yeah. Oh, so I think good. a lot of us. Have, and it's funny now because tape cassettes are like highly collectible and stuff. Here I am, you know, like, oh no, don't throw that away. But it's crazy how uh, <laughs> how times go. But uh, speaking of mob steel, you know, many of us have. I mean, dude, I've followed it since I think like the website was first up. I mean, I've always enjoyed it. But there's got to be a little bit of a backstory, maybe on 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 when you finally said, "Hey, I'm going to start this business." Like, can you tell us a little bit of that history? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I Mob Steel was just kind of like, you know, was it on? It was just a thing where I just wanted to design and build stuff, and you know, work with metal, and you know, I was already a gearhead. You know, I'd already customized a bunch of vehicles, and that was just my thing. And um, you know, I'd been into boats, and I'd been into motorcycles, and all kinds of stuff and 
I was into all kinds of other things, like just anything fab up. I mean, you know, furniture and anything design wise and build wise. And, um, I just kind of like thought it was a neat hobby. And then, you know, the economy was terrible and we were just having a lot of fun doing it. And one of the first Lincolns I put out, I finished, I had had several of them and I just never had the time or money to finish them. And it kind of got me motivated to finish one of them and just kind of push everything forward, you know, I just, of sharing what I thought was cool and my hobby. And, um, you know, mob steel was just, you know, kind of a, a cool thing. It was just a group of guys at the time. Um, my cousin, Steve and, um, my buddy, Nate, and, um, a bunch of other people would come in and out and, you know, it was just kind of like a consortium of, you know, some talented people. And I really wanted to make something of it, and, you know, showcase their talents and see where it could go. And, you know, people came and came and gone. And, you know, as my years of, of chasing, you know, I, I let that first Lincoln go and it was so poorly received and so well received at the same time <laughs> that I kind of, I, you know what I mean? Yeah. I, I knew I was onto something. I knew I was onto something because most people didn't get it. And I got, and I got a lot of questions and that was for years. Like that wasn't just the first year. The first year was brutal. Some of the things that were said to us were pretty abrasive and we weren't particularly the most tamest of people at the time either. We were young, (laughs) right? You know, this was, this was like two, almost two decades ago. Yep. So, you know, it was, it was different times and we were received differently and we reacted differently, but eventually it was one of those things where it was well received too by some people. And then that in turn, you know, the grittiness of it and the the uniqueness of it and its persona being from the Midwest and being more of the, you know, the worker side of things Mm -hmm. and, you know, a vehicle that maybe was a little more reasonable and maybe not a, you know, just didn't hit the radar on most cars that were out there, man. You know, you're talking 68 Camaros, 67 shoebox Novas. You know, things were getting done that were very high, high end um, restaurants. You're like the West Coast community at the time. Boyd Coddington was a big name yep. at the time. Um, so that was the world that we were playing in saying, hey, now Mob Steel is going to be a custom car builder. So we got this reaction out of people with this Lincoln. And so it was a really it was a huge uphill battle, you know, in terms of anybody accepting it or anybody thinking it was cool um, initially. But. Um, again, there was that other side where people were like, hang on, you know what I mean? This is really cool. And, you know, the talent side, the worker side of it, and it just drew people in. We just had some awesome people come in and out of that business yeah. um, and donate, you know, the best of what they had. And um, it was just, that was really like the big thing that became Mob Steel, really, was the people inside of the building. And it was exactly kind of what it was named after, you know. And so as I as I kept trying to figure out, you know, what to do with this, you know, Mob Steel continually um, was a magnet for talent mm-hmm. during some pretty tough times in the industry. And we were super fortunate to have people come in and out of that building that when, when you know, put together on kind of the same path and the same goal, no matter our indifferences or attitude problems or whatever, man, um, you know, you get a bunch of people on the hunt to build a custom car and achieve something. Um, we, we've always used you know, the sum of its parts, it was always bigger than the sum of its parts. It was always that theory and non-summativity. And so, you know, Mob Steel became about this, you know, group of people that could accomplish some pretty cool things and compete with some pretty cool brands Mm -hmm. and big names. And, you know, to take a, take a, a brand that when we dropped a Lincoln, you know, at our first show and people were like, what, you know, what the heck, that's the, this ride and that, why the hell would you bring that? And the criticism and to, you know, march through that with some real talent in the building. And then next thing you know, you're on, you know, Ford is, you know, giving a design award, you're on stage and validating your brand. And, you know, when you told somebody, man, someday I'm going to be building these for, you know, athletes and entertainers and, you know, some people chuckle and next thing you know, you're building cars for athletes and entertainers. I just think no matter what, what you're trying to share, you know, Mob Steel has been proof of if you put your, if you put your focus on that and you all align yourselves correctly, that you know you can do it you know and but you know we had to learn that that was that was a 17 year overnight success remember this whole journey although was 
entertainment enough each step of the way because it was it was so much fun and so exciting and you know it really wasn't about the money because we were getting to live just such an incredible journey um so you know it was kind of that what we were sharing like look if you just you know shoot for some different things and some different goals together and it's just not about profit or it's just not about this you know you can make some really cool things happen Mm -hmm. you know and, and whether you know whether that's how people spell success or not it was how we spelled it at the time because you know i grew up watching you know like anything's possible you know i grew up watching same thing as you right mtv cribs yeah and you know they're i'm watching these lime green lambos and these people just new money all over the place man and for me it was like at the time was reasonable i thought well i could be a millionaire by the time i'm 25 i mean this doesn't seem like a big deal (laughs) you know because Because people were just, like, getting rich over the stock market and all these things. And, like, it was just madness in the 90s. It was Mm -hmm. madness. And, man, I'm going to tell you, when I watched that stuff hit a wall, and I realized right away that I was brought up much differently than that MTV crib stuff. I was brought up in a shop. Mm -hmm. And I was brought up to be, to help myself and work hard and, you know, all these other things. It was much, much different than what I was being shown as you know, what you should be shooting for on TV. And I realized how that was getting more and more distant from reality. Like Mm -hmm. I, it hit me like sooner than everybody else because I was in, I was working in those plants. I was watching businesses shut down. I was watching people struggle. And I was watching a trend that I knew was going to be here for a long, long time. And I started turning back and looking at what was influencing us. And I said, that's not going to be influencing anybody anymore. Brands like Bob Steele will be more and more relevant as time marches on, because it's what people are going to be able to build common ground with and identify with, like, you know, that you're, nobody's going to be, you know, hitting it big like that. You know, people are, people are going to be working hard again. And, you know, these, some of these times are here to stay for a while. And, you know, the brand just became more identifiable with people. It became, you know, a little more relevant to the lives they're living. And, you know, and we've always valued, you know, what people have, have done what American workers have done and what they've built. And, and it's not just, you know, we celebrate the car, which is cool because look at, look at the talent, look what Mm -hmm. they've built. It's incredible. It's inspired me to, to develop a whole brand around it. Mm -hmm. So it's something that's worth celebrating. Um, so that really became our focus, but you know, as we matured and we started growing as a business, you know, we realized like, you know, the story to share is a little broader than that because it's really celebrating what they've built, you know, these communities, these schools, the infrastructure and really the wealth, you know, cause the wealth was, it was what made, you know, the night, all the, all these people's lives, you know, mm-hmm. uh, fantastic and, and gave them security and, you know, and that's what a lot of people are missing nowadays. We think our indifferences are, you know, whatever, whatever we're being poised in front of us to say, Hey, here's what you need to hate each other over, mm-hmm. or here's what you need to argue about, or it's you against you, or it's the right against the left or whatever it is. Right. Yep whatever they're saying it is, we all have one common problem and that's, we have a deterioration of the wealth that fed these communities. We're not making thing, things in here anymore and Detroit's real proof of that. So if we can share that message and say, Hey, here's how we get back to it. I don't know if it's, if it works or not or whatever, but you know, at least we can draw some attention to it as a brand. And in the meantime, try to show some success in action, you know, like, okay, I'm, this is what we're talking about and we're backing it up. You know, we're testing yes. it. We're saying, you know, maybe, maybe if we, if we manu- start manufacturing things again here and we start doing them with the right intent, right. And it revolves around the customer and it revolves around the employee, right. And building that wealth back into them and their communities and giving them security and building value back in each other, you know, whether it's leaning into each other as industry or leaning into each other. Um, and like we do at mob steel, and building brands together, mm-hmm. my my crew and myself. That's our whole mission, right? Is how do we um, how do we act and behave uh, and build a culture as a company that's inviting for talent and yes. inviting for people to continually build value and 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 also build a business that rewards that. Says, look, you know, here's a path, here's an avenue for us to rebuild ourselves, and you know. We, we're, we always stand around and wait for somebody to create that opportunity. So we would like to build a model that says, here's how you create the opportunity for yourselves. Um, and here's what it looks like. Because most of the people, including myself inside of that building, are 
you know, only really have the foundational experience and influence of the people around us. Mm -hmm. Um, and we've built on that, you know, and we've, you know, kind of picked what we feel creates success. Um, and, you know, and try to do that. And it's just, you know, how do you, how do you recreate that path? How do you say, okay, listen, maybe we can start up some small businesses, you know, if it values the American worker this way and everything, and it's not just about profit, you know, does it work? I don't know. So far, so good. You know, at least in terms of branding, our brands, you know, have been received very, very well, Mm -hmm. you know, and, and people have, you know, people have cheered for us and rooted for us and big companies have rooted for us and validated us and, and align their brands with us and align their missions, uh, have lined up with us and the values. And so I really feel like we're onto something, mm-hmm. you know, and it's worth sharing. So, you know, it's a heck of a lot of fun. I don't know where I went. So we started with that, but <laughs> no, that's great. That's it. No, it's it, yeah. You just gave, gave me an open funnel <laughs> to paint the picture I wanted. Dude, it's gold, Adam. It's gold. And, and you know, I, it's funny cause a couple things to unpack. I came from like the mini truck world, although you know, I remember watching Gleaming the Cube and seeing a 65 Lincoln going, man, I, I want one of those. But coming up in the mini truck world, you know, Courtney Hollowell, rest in peace, was a big name. And he, um, oh, yeah. you know, he has, as you know, that, you know, the famous kind of Wyatt Strange quote. And it kind of ends with others laugh at us when we spend hours on end working on our trucks, which you could you could say cars, mm-hmm. trucks, yet shake our hands when we are done. And, you know, I think about that and kind of get goosebumps because I go, you know, it ties into what you just said. It's um, when I think of your brand, I remember 20 some odd years ago, you know, and we were all younger, right? We were all kind of, you know, it was a different era, the 90s, the grunge, that you know, the, the different things that kind of mm-hmm. um, that that drove a lot of things. But like you guys have grown just like, you know, all of us should grow. You know, we should be in a better place maybe than our 20s, you know, when we're in our 40s. And I remember, you know, mm-hmm. some of the apparel that you guys had, and I loved it. You know, it was kind of more brash and stuff. But I've seen you guys grow, mm-hmm. like as people, as a you know, as a business, as a community. And that's the one thing that I appreciate. I mean, I look up to companies like you guys because I go, you know, wow, look at Adam. He's doing a motivational speech, which, by the way, you kind of just did on this podcast. So thank you. And I think about it and say, man like you see the success, the hard work, it's like, it motivates me to go, you know what? I want to be a better person. You know, I want to try a little bit harder. And I mean, I just want to say, I mean, truly from, from some, a guy in the, in the scene that loves what you guys do, man, you know, I appreciate you, man. Oh, I appreciate it, man. That, that means a lot. The, uh, especially coming from a mini trucker. I mean, that's <laughs> literally one of the most in, influential car communities, um, to what we do now, the suspension, the revolutionary, uh, um, concepts of all the different types of air ride. And like, I mean, that all comes from the mini truck world. Yeah. Yep. I, 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 uh, I remember, um, I grew up with these kids, the Hammonds and Brett who became actually, you know, became an asset to us. He, he's the one that kind of taught us how to use CAD. And, you know, these were, you know, those moments of leaning into each other when mm-hmm. we were building our company. Um, you know, we were trying to grow just like, you know, we were the little last comment here about, you know, kind of, um, you know, getting a little more sophisticated and trying to educate ourselves and move forward as a company and not rely on people to, you know, machine stuff for us and, you know, start vertically integrating some things and challenge ourselves to become better and create better products. And, um, you know, Brett, I grew up with Brett and he had a convertible, one of the first convertible S10s I've ever seen oh, in person. Yeah. Yep. And he'd cut, the, he'd cut the roof on and did the conversion himself and lowered it and had the saw blades and had the eight inch pile drivers in it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, man. Dude, he was the coolest. I mean, like, yeah. I mean, he had the mullet. He wore skids. <laughs> yeah, he was the coolest dude in the world, man. And, yeah, and um, it's cool because it's all kind of really good friends of him. Yeah, and it's kind of cool because it's all becoming. It's kind of coming full circle. A lot of us are. I don't want to dare I say you know midlife, but I mean the whole mini truck scene is kind of back, you know, and it's it's cool. Oh but... God, the little squares we can because he can afford it now. It's <laughs> right. amazing, and the, and look how much money people are getting for him because we can afford them. Yeah, I and, love it. And now so we're like, awesome. hey, we want 15s, we don't want 24s because yep. that's what we had, you know. Yep. So it's kind of yeah, cool. yeah, exactly, yeah. It's kind of cool. I, I and you know, and as mature in the maturing part of it, like being able to look back and you know, and say, Hey, I, I love the fact that, um, you know, we had, we had a, we had a persona and you know, we still are, we yeah. talk about a company about not, not losing the, the DNA that created us. And we put a thumb on what that is and what impressed people. And that's the fact that we are just this gritty, no quit. Just, I mean, it's a, it's brutal. Like if you thought you would come in and work with us, the people that came in and, and hadn't had, had the chance to put their hands on, 
watching my crew perform and, and the amount of hours and the diligence and the dedication, it, it really is truly incredible. And it's, and it separates people in a hurry. It really starts to thin the herd. And I always equated it to like having the Navy seals of workers, right. Or something of that nature, mm -hmm. right. It's just not a circus. These are the best of the best and, and effort and hard work and being effective man, that's a skill and, yep. and that's a mental battle and that's everything. And it's a physical battle. And to watch a group of, you know, 10, 12 people do that, um, intimately, like whether you're a production company that came and watched us, you can ask anybody. It is one impressive thing and, and you don't see it a lot. And that was one of the most like rewarding things. And that, and that's really what defined mob steel. And that's what's defined our success is that no quit attitude and that type of work ethic and that type of drive. And I know that's not for everybody. Okay, but that's that we're the professional athletes of the shop world and, and that's our bragging rights. And, and Mob Steel's success is that trophy that everybody gets to wear that was in and out of that place and put in those hundred plus hour weeks for six months on end, you know, and, and never missed those due dates and built the cars that we built with the money we had and with the time we had. And every time it was it was that it was that. It was that some of it's, it just didn't equal the sum of its parts. It was always better because of everybody's effort. So, you know, it was really that that we held on to. And the rest of it, man, as we matured and we realized that we had an audience and we realized our impact we could make in terms of creating, you know, some, some trends and influence in the wheel industry. And we could literally start manufacturing things here. And we had that personality. We had that mm -hmm. DNA to face that challenge, to create Detroit Steel Wheel Co. and say, we're going to fight this battle. And we fight it today harder than we fought it the first day mm. of just trying to manufacture something here, just trying to meet the demand we've created. Yep. And that's what we're committed to because that's what we're preaching. So I have the right group of people. We're fighting that battle, but the rest of it, we had to mature, right? We had to, we had to understand how to control our character, to face that bullseye of success for everybody in that building. And that meant forcing ourselves to mature and control ourselves and manage ourselves and manage our behavior, and at the end of that, that's what they call being mature. And when people look at us, and I and I love having this conversation with people, because some people look at us and they go, "Man, I remember how you used to be, man." You're and and I love when people use the word sellout or right, something like that, and people right. want to say, "I remember when you guys were wild and you used to do X, Y, and Z." I don't brag about that stuff anymore, but I will brag about this. Thank God I grew up, right? And thank <laughs> yes. God I learned Amen. how to control my behavior because I would have never created the path for success or led any of these people to where they're at now. And as a matter of fact, my goal is that I can be better and better and better at that. Like I can continue to learn how to control my behavior and point it towards success for them at a steeper path because that's what they deserve. And that's, and as a business owner, if that's what your focus is, right. I'm, I, and just like Henry Ford said it, my, my job is to handle the money from my customer to my employees. That's it. So if I can do that in the, the grandest, most efficient way possible and create the greatest growth for them and, and, and show them how to get there, that's what I should do. Otherwise, I'm not the captain of the ship. Somebody else should wow. do it. Yeah. So, and, and so that's, that's we, everybody lives by that in our, in our place. And when, and when you see that clicking, it's incredible. And we, we face the same challenge as everybody else does. Mm -hmm. Controlling, managing yourself and managing your behavior all the time is very, very difficult. And it's a process that you get better and better and better at. And Steve and I have become control ourselves and have tried to become a master of that and, and, and trying to get everybody else, you know, to do that too. And, you know, we do that through, you know, some structure and this is what's expected of you. And, and we're all going to work on this. And, and when we have those challenges in the workplace and we feel our culture is being effective, we stop and we go, Hey guys, what's happening? You know, something's infecting this here. It's not, it's not a one of us, you know, cause all of our goal is to, you know, be faced in this direction and, and be shooting for this. And so it's really interesting to try to create that culture, try to create that type of a team and try to create that type of a business because it's, it's a high road. It's not, it's not the quick path to money. It's not, it's not what some people would say, here's how you write a successful business and, and a story, uh, but it's ours, oh, you know, yeah. so we're, we're, we're trying, we're trying to, at the end of it, even though it's a little tougher and a little longer road, I tell everybody in the shop, I said, you know, it would be my great American business story is to turn around and say, this is what we were shooting for. And this is what happened. We've got a group of people that have created this much success, whether it's, um, the journey 
and and hopefully the finances mm -hmm. and everything else and the balance in their life and and now more and more stairs underneath them to be filled that are good paying jobs and bring money to the community and take raw materials and turn it into a product and create real wealth and so you know we're trying to do that as a team so you know every time the, the 99 percent of the time we're flying in the direction together we are that you know that's that group of navy seals in there and it's really neat to see it happen oh yeah that cohesive it's, it's really neat it's really neat as a bit as somebody who started it and realizes that you know you know this this machine that they're that that these people are running and, and doing between the wheels and the cars and you know it's it's pretty amazing yeah no doubt about it that cohesiveness that you need you know as a business and I wanted to ask you this, you know, your team and, you know, you and your team have built some very cool vehicles over the years. A few come to mind for me. Is there one that maybe stands mm -hmm. out in your mind? I, I remember one, um, you know, I always try to give photo credit and I was doing some digging and I found the 64. I knew that you guys had built it, but, you know, I kind of found out it was this guy named Joseph, I think Safina, just this amazing car, yeah. engine swap, all this stuff. You know, do you have one, you know, even if it's not a Lincoln that comes to mind that you go, man, that, that, that was one of my favorites. Maybe I wish I could have had it or whatever. That car, that car was really cool. They were all very cool. I mean, I, Joe's a great guy. Joe's awesome. We've had some really cool customers. That's cool. That, that car, some of the shots of that car, that interior of that car, yes. that was one of the, that was one of the first vehicles that we put a mod motor in, an actual Ford mod motor in very difficult. You know, you, you have to remember, not only was there not a lot, lot of stuff available for right, Lincoln, right. Uh, there wasn't there wasn't a lot of stuff available to put mod motors in cars. Yeah. There wasn't the right transmissions to talk to them. There wasn't the right brains, and we worked with some companies and um, you know did everything we could, and we built the best best product we could when at the money that we could demand at the time. And um, those vehicles uh, were cool, man. They were awesome. I I actually like that one. That was a great one. I I like them all. I mean, we've we've learned a lot from all of them, and we've always raised the bar. Um, and we've done that, you know, again, what is the, what is the brand demand today? What did it demand yesterday? And yeah. we've always used those opportunities to build those cars. They're really lost leaders. They're very expensive to build. They take a ton of time, but that was really like what we enjoyed doing. That's what we shot for. Even if that's all we wanted to do is just build a sick car. Yeah. So when somebody gave us the opportunity, we would just go overboard. I, I would say the heavy hitter was probably yes. one of the most iconic cars we've done. Yeah. Probably one of the coolest cars we've done probably one of the coolest, you know, stories through my company. You know, I built that car for my dad originally. Wow. Um, my dad was a big influence on me, you know, pretty much passed down all the skill and the things that, that I've created success with. So it was kind of cool to work with him on that car. And um, he kind of let us, you know, express ourselves where we didn't have a customer, you know, telling us uh, X, Y, and Z. So it was, it was just kind of neat. And then, and then to, you know, we sold that car. It got a little crazy. We sold it. Uh, the guy that bought it, um, kept that car for a decade and he still owns it. And he is an awesome guy. Um, you'll see G rides on Instagram. Yes. Yeah. Their, the whole, their whole family is outstanding. We have such a great relationship with them. They've bought other vehicles that we've built. Um, he has them and his family is, he has a big uh, family out there that all, they all work in the same industry or work for him and they all collect cars and, and has, he has, he has some incredible cars also. Yeah, um, the coupe and then too, also, right? I think. Yep, and then um, so you know that car was the first car that Ron, Ron and I worked on together right. was the heavy hitter, mm -hmm. and Ron, Ron became a big part of Mob Steel. Ron still is a big part. Um, you know, of Ron and I are really tight. Mm -hmm. So you know, Ron was just in the shop the other day and just texted me last night. So so it really drew Ron in because Ron was one of those people that liked mob steel like the persona of it you know he fit he fit that crowd yes. he was he was a highly highly talented a concept car builder who was you know in a tough industry um and i wouldn't say and he and he worked under some really cool people um where the, the, the company he worked for has built some incredible things where he came from there to my place mm -hmm. uh, kenny annis and all those guys at special projects have built some just not i mean nuts look up look up movie cars and concept cars and so you know again it just it was a place where doing that talent and then also you know ron was ready to retire as a painter when he came to work for me he had left wow. con uh he had left he had left um uh, kenny's place when the industry got really slow and devastated and um he was doing some bump stuff and that really wasn't his gig and he started media blasting 
and I actually had to media blast some stuff first mm -hmm. and, you know, knew he was a painter and then I'm somehow suckered him into painting <laughs> something. I remember, I remember I was working like, you could tell he was cut from the same cloth. Cause I remember the first time we interacted, he came and he started working on some things and he's like, all right, I'll help you get these. Let's take these back to my buddy's shop and where he was working bumping at the time. He said, let's paint this bumper, this hood. Um, so they're not as dirty because uh, we were painting them in my shop and these parts were getting, they were just dirty. We had to cut and rub everything. So I didn't have a paint booth. Um, and I was managing it with filters and a makeshift booth the best I could. Yep, yep. Um, and so, so I took the parts to this place, painted them. I was on my 36 hour of work, no sleep. Wow. And I was driving back and I remember him going, Hey man, you all right? I go, yeah, I'm fine. He goes, you, he goes, you okay? I go, yeah, I'm fine. He goes, it looks like you're falling asleep. I go, I'm not. And I don't know if he like felt like obligated to stay, but he just stayed, man. He just stayed, stayed. And then I felt like he didn't leave. I took him out of retirement <laughs> and put him back on painting, put him back on, you know, he, he's got 10 years on us. Wow. So a decade later, he looked at me and we were actually redoing the heavy hitter. And he just said, man, I'm, this is it for me, man. This is the last deal. And we had the heavy hitter for about a year and we had him and I had talked and we talked about him moving on and, you know, maybe doing something a little bit different instead of, you know, what he was doing It's labor intensive. It's a young man's game and there really wasn't anybody to come in behind him. And, you know, we just didn't do the volume of builds, mm -hmm. um, you know, to, to have somebody come in and have them mentor. And I was hoping that we could have started some sort of program with them and, and had to mentor people. And I, and I may still will, but, yep. um, you know, so that car, that car was very iconic. It, uh, it was a cool project with my dad. It's with a great, great, we have a great relationship with them. That car will come back during the hundred celebration, the archangel and the heavy hitter both will be there awesome. um, for that celebration. Uh, it was, it was the car that introduced Ronnie and I, and, and also was the one he really truly retired as a painter on as I got him <laughs> to come out for another decade. Yeah, that was technically so, that was technically uh, the five O version, right? That's what it was dubbed, right? I think. Yeah. Yep. Yep. We came. Yeah. So the car was a, a decade old, and and you know now it was time for you know some of the things that we've learned as as a crew mm -hmm. are the neatness and you know the tidiness of building a car, and um, you know the new stuff that was available to us, Lincoln products that were available now that mm -hmm. people are making in the industry, and all kinds of neat aftermarket stuff, and we were working with Bear now. Um, had some really good quality brakes instead of the other stuff that was on the market being mm -hmm. offered. And, um, you know, just, just some really cool stuff. And, you know, we worked with some of the very, very first, first ones of those, you know, very, very first items, the first trying to first put the fuel injection on those cars, you know, yep. um, and now getting to experience some of the new high, uh, Holly sniper stuff that is going on everything. So it works flawless and fighting through some of those first, those very first um, mod motors and, yes. and and trying to get those on an old school car and putting and doing the stuff with Ford Ford Performance um, when we were doing the mod, uh, the, the twin turbo stuff on the F100 mm -hmm. on the TV show and fighting through some of those battles. And, you know, all of those moments were such, those challenges are where you take giant leaps as a company. We had influence all around us, people from the industry, people from, you know, um, a Ford Performance and Ford, 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 Ford Motor Company and, and designers and directors and like everybody interacting with you and giving you their foundational experience and knowledge in those moments. And we grew by leaps and bounds. So we, we love those challenges, whether it's tough times or, or tough projects or being the first to the table. Yeah, it was so much fun. You know, and regardless of, you know, man, we, the last one we did was so much better than the other one, but Man, it's, that's because you know yeah, we've we've, just, we've really really been just neat just neat stuff being and it's because <laughs> we're right in the heart of it. Man. We're oh, right yeah. we're right next to it. We're right where they build these things. We're right where the experts are at, and, and that's why we just talk brag about the industry. You know, so it, it was really cool, and it was and it was getting to you know, and again that was that was all benefits of you know us growing up as a company and interfacing with you know some really valid you know people. Yeah, some big companies, and it's crazy when you start really getting into it and building those relationships. You know, the sky's the limit, and you know these big companies have some serious talent in them. the The, the workers inside of these buildings are crazy smart, crazy talented. They they have created a structure that you know they they draw the best talent, and they have great budgets, and you know so you know people whether they were used to be in the industry or in the industry or something like that. Yeah, it's it's pretty neat to have 
you know, always have those people around and, and you don't even, you don't even access those resources all the time. There's so much of it. And even as, even at my age and the amount of time I've spent in this industry, it's still like, you know, you're like, Jack, I didn't know you did that. Or you're like, Sherry, you're in charge of, you know, the, the <laughs> this whole 10 speed program, this global transmission, or like you had no idea, like you can know these people for a decade and they may just be people that don't really talk about what they do. And then when you start really diving into what they do and what they do for the automotive industry and their talent, you're like, holy smokes. Like I could have, I could have, I could have used this information. <laughs> yeah. You know, really? Seven, eight years ago. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably why they didn't open their mouth, but oh, yeah. you know, it's cool. We're talking with Adam Janai from Mob Steel. Look up Mob Steel, of course, on all social media platforms. Just a couple more questions for you. You hinted just a moment ago. I, I did see through social media that um, there was something in the works that's going to kind of tie into the Woodward Dream Cruise. Now, I got a chance to go years ago kind of just for one evening because we were going down to Indy Truck Bash that weekend, but we had flown up to Michigan. I didn't get to experience the whole thing, but... We all know that Lincoln is uh, this year's the hundredth anniversary. Goes back a long time. Can you give us any hints at what, kind of what's the calm as far as what you guys got boiling over there? Yeah, we got. Um, we are going to have uh, a Lincoln. We're going to unveil a Lincoln there, and it's. I, I'm. I'm pretty sure it's not a complete secret. So uh, <laughs> Emma didn't give me any guidelines. Oh, cool, <laughs> so cool. if I if I spill if I spill something, my bad. <laughs> um, but you know, I like to be transparent with my audience. Uh, I'm an honest guy. So we're doing a, uh, we're doing a Lincoln. We're doing a six. We're doing a, we're, I, I, we'll just say we're doing a Lincoln. Yep. And I'll let you in on kind of the theme of it. Um, the aesthetics, it's the, it's the outrun aesthetics. And you're going to really going to dig this because this comes from the mini <laughs> trucking days and the eighties. And, you know, it's, it's all that, um, you know, that, that pop looking stuff and the Memphis style fader stuff, you know, it's called, it's called the motors, motor city vice. It's got some really cool colors on it. We've worked with uh, Brooke Bannum, who has come up with some um, exclusive. We've designed some exclusive repeating patterns and some designs uh, that go with this vehicle. The vehicle is, again, like the outrun aesthetic. So it's like, you know, it's got this really cool kind of like lighter bluish gray color. And it's got some colorful brakes and suspension. And um, we're doing this really cool theme between fashion and the vehicle where, um, the interior components, there's exchangeable components that you pull off the seats and the door inserts and things in the Lincoln, um, in the stock spots of the Lincoln of this black interior. And you put in, you know, the different color combinations and the different patterns. And those will also coincide with, you know, the Nike swoosh on your shoes. And so wow. it's going to have some fashion involved in it in the trunk. And so you can make, make your apparel, your kicks match your vehicle. Um, we all know kind of, you know, the kicks and the, the car business go yeah. hand in hand. So we just kind of combine those two and, um, it's just kind of something fun and it's just something different. You know, I think one of the cool things about what we can do now is just, you know, kind of be expressive and kind of be in the moment or ahead of things. Like we started building this car, um, a couple of years ago. So this was way ahead of kind of the, the trend, but it's a good timing for it. So we decided we want to finish it up and, um, unveil it there. I mean, the fact that we're a part of Lincoln's hundred celebration at, at the Woodward dream show is, I mean, that's come on, that's killer. I mean, as somebody who played in that Lincoln and, you know, used to cut them out and put them on the fridge and then, you know, some that, you know, eventually got to build them and, and share that with everybody, you know, to be a part of that celebration. So we, we want to get that car wrapped up. Brooke has full scale artwork. That's absolutely gorgeous that he did of this vehicle, you know, his version of this vehicle. So again, being able to work with a world-class designers right here, in the Motor City, oh, yeah. that do everything from design brand new vehicles, instructor at C uh, you know CCS, and and he also designs clothing and shoes and things like that. So to have that talent wow. and be able to just put that right, inject that right into Mob Steel's brand, you know, come on, we're we're having a ball, dude. This is really <laughs> surreal. It's oh fun. yeah, <laughs> you know, it's well, it's killer. So I can't I can't wait. We're gonna be hanging out down there. I hope everybody comes down. We don't get a lot. We don't get to do a lot of these events, and we pick these very carefully. It, this is going to represent us well. M1 Concourse has given us this beautiful spot. There's a whole, we have a whole spot for Mob Steel. So come down. We're going to have uh, Detroit Cookie Company there and a bunch of our friends from the Historical Society and, and everybody here in town. And we have friends flying in from Scottsdale and all over the world. It's during the Dream Dream Cruise. It's, it's a couple million people. It's, I, I can't even explain to you how many cars and the varieties and, 
it's really surreal. Just come on out, figure out how to get out here. I, I don't, I don't know. We'll help you in any way we can. Let's do it. Oh Let's yeah, get out here. We're gonna Hell's go. yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm gonna try to make it up, and I'm looking, I'm looking forward to it. I wanted to before we end. You know, we talked about Detroit Steel. Uh, you, you talked about for a moment Detroit Steel Wheel Co. And I mean, I love the brand. I really do. I just wanted to hit on, you know, because I think it's such, like you said, that there's a demand. You know, to me, it kind of started off as like maybe one or two choices. I went on the website the other day, which, by the way, folks, super user friendly, love the website. There's so many choices that people have. And I love that you guys, you know, it ties into the name with the steel. It has that manufacturing tie in as well. And you're trying to kind of bring back and do your part for Detroit area. Um, what would you just want to share with the audience in reference to like the Det- Detroit Steel Wheel Co. in general? You know, I first of all, I'd like to, you know, thank, now, I mean, obviously I, I praise the crew all the time, but our customers, man, I can't thank them enough because it really starts with people demanding a product. And I think that us supplying the most valuable product we can to them for the best price, you know what I mean? Like, yes. let's be honest with ourselves. It's not a, it's not a $24 wheel that I marked up to 300 some bucks because it's gone through a bunch of hands and it yep, sits yep. in warehouses and right. I want to make this thing here. I want to build it right for my customer and I want it to be the best I possibly can. And everybody inside of my building, that's all they care about is making that customer happy. And that makes me, that's what, that's what our whole goal is. So, yep. you know, first of all, everybody involved in being patient with that brand and waiting on product and because the demand has been really incredible, but we haven't raised our price based on that demand. I haven't played games with our customers. I've kept what I believe is the, the best value for that product. It's because we're working as hard as we can and we're, and we're not overpaying ourselves. We're being reasonable but with what the economy is like and what people can afford. And we're trying to live by that. And I think um, we've found a really good balance. And I know, you know, things are getting tough and, you know, fuel prices have gone up and our steel has tripled. And nobody can find workers in our supply chain. And, our, you know, our supply chain here in the U.S. is very tough. Mm. They already have a difficulty supplying us. And then add COVID and all these things. So they're working hard. But most of all, my, my people inside of the building have found, we have found efficiencies. We've changed the way, we've changed some things in our operations. And we've mm-hmm. changed things physically on the floor and the way we handle products. And we have done all of these so we didn't have to raise the price on our customers. Because that's our focus. And it wasn't about you know, our pockets or anything like that. So, you know, there's a lot of impressive stuff going on um, with the Detroit Steel Wheel Co. brand. And there's a lot coming. Like, if if we can show that this type of behavior is sustainable, even if we have to raise the prices a little bit because we can't fend off this whole inflation and our cost of living and everything, but if we can show, you know, that our behavior works and, you know, we we have great product ready to go. We just are committed to making it here. So if I can say, man, anything, we have great interest from the automotive industries. We've had great interest from big retailers. We have a lot of options, but um, we first are concerned about getting that product directly in our customers' hands. Um, we do it, you know, we, we, build, we build these wheels for your vehicle. There's not many people that do that, you know. The person that answers the phone is is really incredible that they can sit there and have the conversation with you and through your modifications and what you've done to those vehicles, and especially you and I coming from mm-hmm. aftermarket mini trucks, slam stuff, you know, when you call to get something for these and you say you've changed an axle or anything, all of a sudden there's a big problem. Mm-hmm. We come from a custom car building world, and my, and my crew does it the best. And we ship these things all over the world, and they fit the vehicles. You know what I mean? We don't, we don't, we're not in the practice of shipping things out that don't fit, so we try to get those as accurate as possible, and that's a talent and a service in its own. Um, so the performance, and we have great product waiting for some really cool car segments, light truck, SUV, this this growing Landover market, um, really cool stuff. But we we can't even we can't supply the classic market and some of the ones we're doing now. So we want to stay focused on those customers. Um, but very soon, very soon in the future, um, we are focused on scaling. As long as we're scaling here in the U.S. And we're doing everything we can to scale closest to home. Um, we have found some other people in the industry to lean on, um, like-minded people who know that very soon, you know, we're going to have to manufacture things here again. But we have to do it in the fashion of valuing the people inside of those buildings. Mm-hmm. So we're, we've, we've joined some like-minded people to, um, you know, start rebuilding a, 
a workforce together and start rebuilding some of this manufacturing capacity together. Um, so I'm excited to see where this goes in the future. Um, and, um, you know, I'm excited for people to see what we already have sitting and waiting. I mean, we have some beautiful designs, some beautiful product, um, some things people have been waiting for. But, you know, the fact that people have been patient with this brand um, and we have the rapport we do with this brand, um, you know, we, there's nothing more than we'd love to do is get this product into everybody's hands in exactly the way they want it. Um, but, you know, we want to do it in a fashion where it's being done here and that wealth is being kept right here at home and rebuilding these schools and, and, you know, the healthcare and people's ways of lives. And, you know, some of these communities that, you know, we do business in, it's, you know, these, these people don't have an easy time. So, oh, yeah. you know, we want to, we want to make sure we're fighting that battle first and being forward thinking. And, you know, so there's a lot on our plate as a company, it's just a small group of us and our plate is full of everything, but, you know, focusing on profit and lining our pockets. And it's crazy that I even have those people inside of a building agreeing to fight that battle with us. So, um, it's just, it's just awesome. You know, yeah. it's really cool to have that support. I just can't wait for people to see what's coming. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll be focused on our customers and we'll stay focused on doing the right thing as a brand, even as we expand, um, I mean, we expand our efforts right here at home. Um, you know, the processes that we're, we're adding, we're making sure that we're making the right choices as a company for, mm -hmm. you know, the future of the globe and the planet. You know, are we, are we manufacturing? Are we doing that? You know, are we doing that the smart way? Are we doing that the green way and the right way? And are we doing it forward thinking? Are we, are we leading in everything? And that's what I challenge everybody in my business. If we're two years ahead of the curve, in design and we're two years ahead on what's next and what's cool and we can set that trend right can we apply that to everything are we leading the trend in what's next in marketing companies and how we market companies and how we treat and value people are we are we ahead of the trend on you know if we're diving into a process or a procedure is it the way that it should be done in the future is it the safest way and the best way and the most reasonable way and is it the best product for my customer and you know are we weighing everything that way so, you know, this is not an easy fight that I'm asking mm -hmm. out of my group and out of this brand. Um, it's really stacks the deck against them. But at the end of the day, when they do pull that off, it, re it really keeps separating us from the herd. Oh, it yeah. really, it really points our ship in a complete different direction than these other brands. And as we keep continuing to create success year after year after year, and that needle keeps the point onward and upward, it's harder for people to catch this brand, you know? So, um, we want to make this, we want to make this not only, you know, the milestone for people to grab, but also the direction. And you know, we want some of these companies to turn around and say, okay, you know what, maybe we need to think about the way we restructure this or sacrifice some of this. And, and, you know, now the popular thing is to make it here, you know, maybe, you know, force them to start to turn that ship around and uh, start to think that way and show them that it's the right and popular thing to do. Or maybe it was just, maybe in the future it was the profitable thing to do and we're just the first people to disable. Right, so, right. you know, we'll, we'll continue. Yeah, we'll continue to fight that battle. You know, hope, oh, yeah. we're hoping that we do the right thing first and, and the profits are in abundance later. Um, you know, that 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 should be the battle. Oh, yeah. So, that's how you can expect out of Detroit Steel Wheel Co. Hell yeah. Group in that building. I would uh, encourage people to go to DetroitSteelWheel.com. Uh, you can see uh, they're, they're all transparent. You've got the wheel catalog with tons of designs. You also have the wheel price list, so you kind of know what you're getting into if it's going to fit your budget. Also, um, like to Adam's point, they'll do a lot of inf you know information gathering to make sure that you're getting the right offset. If you're not familiar with wheels, that's one of the most important things in terms of ordering, uh, of course, along with the size. But um, we certainly appreciate um, you know all of that information. I guess just to kind of close and, and sum it up that, you know, I'll say this, man, I've seen like, and I've heard it on this uh, podcast with you, Adam, you know, when you think about the commitment that you guys have, um, you know, I've seen some of the motivational stuff where you've uh, spoken, you know, with the credit union and things like that, and and all of the um, the 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 things that you see in your employees and the great folks that you have, man, and the message that you had today, man, I, I can't thank you enough. And and listen, man, I know the sky's the limit for for you guys, and I know you've got your lovely life. Uh, I, I got a chance to meet her uh, uh, with you guys out at uh, SEMA. Uh, Pam and all the team, man, Steve, they, they all do just a great job in my opinion. Yeah, absolutely. We just, you know, we have a good, great group of people and, you know, and that's, that's what we're celebrating for sure. Hells. Yeah. Well, hopefully we'll see you in August. 
Stay on the rise, as we always say, man, and we'll keep tagging you guys. And huge shout-out to Emma. I don't want to end without saying thanks to Emma. She, I know she does a lot of kind of the social media stuff. I've got a chance to meet her at Lone Star Throwdown and, and SEMA and stuff. She's a great person. I just want to give her two thumbs up. Yeah, she has. She juggles a lot, man. She juggles a lot um, between what Steve and I put on her plate. And, um, you know, she's, she's really, uh, she's, she's really cool. She's been a shining star, uh, in the company and she's been somebody who's wholeheartedly adopted, you know, what, what, um, you know, how we, how we write success. And, uh, she challenges herself all the time to, to be better and better. She, she handles a lot more than people think it's, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's quite a, she handles quite a, quite a deal. She, she's an incredible person. She's good at her job. Well, thanks for the support with Lincoln Addict. And, uh, we're going to keep supporting Mob Steel as well as Detroit Steel Wheel Co., Adam, have a great night with the family, and we'll talk to you soon, brother. Thank you, man. Appreciate it. We'll talk to you, Jason.